summer night in Phoenix, Arizona. It's 11 o'clock, but the maintenance workers at Southwest Airlines are just getting started. Tonight, they're going to open up a state-of-the-art Boeing 737-700. Almost 40 inspectors and mechanics are going to spend the night making sure the plane is fit to fly. Without proper maintenance, airplanes don't fly. Pilots are usually the focus for the operation of the airplane, but maintenance has an equally high priority role in the safe operation of any aircraft. To keep airplanes in peak condition, they get more health checks than most passengers. It is a very intricately weaved web between the operation of the airplane and the maintenance of the airplane and the management of the airplane. Passenger planes are examined every time they come to a stop. This is the A-check. A brief walk-around inspection turns up the most obvious problems. The more intensive work is done at set intervals. These are the B and C checks. Tonight, workers are performing a C check. From start to finish, it can require hundreds of man hours of work. It all has to get finished tonight, so the plane is back flying in the morning. It's a massive challenge, because modern jets are made of hundreds of thousands of individual pieces. In 1903, when the Wright brothers took their historic first flight near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, their plane had some 1,500 parts. A 737 has more than 360,000. You have to ensure that every one of those components is doing its respective job. It doesn't matter how big the part is, a missing screw can jeopardize the safety of flight. It's a lesson the aviation industry has learned the hard way. January 31st, 2000. On board Alaska Airlines Flight 261, the situation is desperate. Operating a damaged plane, the captain is trying to land at Los Angeles Airport, but the aircraft is not responding to controls. The MD-83 is plunging towards the Pacific Ocean. Other pilots flying nearby report the nightmare scene back to LA Air Traffic Control. Yes, there uh, is uh, definitely in a nose down position descending quite rapidly. Definitely out of control. Plane inverted, sir. Okay. Yeah, he's inverted. Push the blue side up! There. Here we go. Just hit the water. Uh, yes, sir. He, uh, yeah, hit the water. He's uh, down. Flight 261 crashed off the coast of California at over 400 kilometers an hour. All 88 passengers and crew are killed. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board begin their work quickly. The cockpit voice recordings provide some of the earliest clues. We have a jam stabilizer and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. We immediately suspected some problem in the tail of the airplane, which is where the controls are. There's something was wrong back there. Investigators examine the MD-83's horizontal stabilizer. The stabilizer controls the plane's pitch, its ability to tilt up and down. As the stabilizer moves up, the plane's nose tilts down. As the stabilizer moves down, the nose moves up. In the MD-83, a motorized jack screw on the tail moves the stabilizer up and down. When investigators recover the tail from the crash site, they make a puzzling discovery. The jack screw wasn't 
mated with the nut that it screws into. It was just by itself. And the nut was found in another piece of structure a few feet away from where the jack screw was. To have a screw separate itself from a, from a nut with very thick threads surprised us. Without the jack screw, the stabilizer was beyond control. Without the stabilizer, the plane was doomed. The investigators very quickly figured out how the accident happened. Now they want to know why. The answer is tragically simple. There was no lubrication or visible grease uh, on the working area of the screw. That was uh, surprising and strange. The Federal Aviation Administration orders an immediate check on all MD-80s in the USA. At Alaska Airlines, the jack screws on six of its fleet of 34 MD-80s fail inspection. Investigators discover even more alarming evidence as they go through the carrier's maintenance records. Mechanics at Alaska Airlines report that they are under tremendous pressure to cut corners to keep the planes flying. We interviewed all the mechanics who had worked on these airplanes. We knew that they had been falsifying records or not doing the work they had indicated. To survive an economic recession in the 1990s, Alaska Airlines slashed their maintenance regime. With air carriers, especially those that may be economically strapped, they're going to stretch inspection cycles to the maximum. The FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, set a minimum level of safety. Now, if you're going to operate on a shoestring, you're only going to meet that minimum level of safety. If I'm a good carrier or I want to be a good carrier and I want to show that we're going to operate at the highest levels of safety, I'm going to typically exceed the minimums. It's going to cost more, but I'm going to exceed it. A lot of companies that say, wait, the regulations only say I only have to go to here. That's what I'm going to do. Jack screws in the company's fleet had been inspected every 500 to 700 flight hours. But in 1996, to cut costs, Alaska Airlines began checking the jack screws every 2,500 hours. At the same time, they doubled the average daily use of their fleet. If you had 600 hours between inspection points and greasing points, we have no chance of ever having a metal-to-metal -metal contact situation. But if you put that out to 2,000 hours or 2,500 hours, now what you do is eat into some of these protective stages, these barriers that we have towards uh, catastrophic failure. Proper maintenance becomes even more critical when there's no backup to a component. On the MD-83, there was no alternative if the jack screw failed. So proper maintenance was a matter of life and death. But in the aviation industry, it's also a matter of dollars and cents. There's a lot of pressure in the airline industry when you look at it, whether you're hauling boxes or hauling people. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that competition is stiff. And how do you get the competitive advantage against the next guy? How am I going to get more for less? And a lot of times it's labor. The other times it's maintenance. If I can stretch the inspection to 500 hours instead of 400 hours, that saves me a lot of money. To stay afloat financially, Alaska Airlines put countless lives at risk. But disaster can erupt even when an airline doesn't cut back on its maintenance regime. Go near the mountain! It's past midnight in Phoenix, Arizona. A maintenance crew works through a 737-700. They're performing a so-called sea check, one of the most detailed inspections any plane can go through. We work out overnight, because that's when nobody, nobody flies. It's better for the air airline to keep the airplane on ground overnight to fix them up. Tonight, 339 individual inspections are set to be made. Each one of these is tracked by computer. Anything that comes up yellow is an unscheduled procedure, a problem that's just been spotted. Unscheduled maintenance are those kinds of things typically that people will experience with their car where they're driving down the highway and all of a sudden the air conditioner doesn't work. Well, the same with an airplane. 
Tonight, the inspectors discover a tire on one of the main landing gears is worn out. They add it to the list of unscheduled maintenance items. It has to be replaced before the plane goes back into service. Obviously, the stakes are extremely high. Um, every night we come to work and try to do our best job possible. Make sure everything's in working order so that people get to where they need to go. But sometimes, despite all the maintenance, the worst case scenario comes true. A simple repair can unexpectedly lead to disaster. August the 13th, 1985, Mount Osutaka, Japan. This is the wreckage from the deadliest single plane disaster in aviation history. JAL Flight 123 crashed the night before, killing 520 passengers and crew. Only four people survived. Because the 747 jet was built in the United States, the National Transportation Safety Board joins the investigation. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Soon after the crash, experts get a helping hand from an amateur photographer. He managed to take a picture of the 747 minutes before it crashed. The picture reveals that JAL Flight 123 was flying without its massive tail fin. The tail fin houses critical control surfaces like the rudder, as well as tubes that carry the hydraulic fluids. What force could be strong enough to tear off the tail fin? I would explain everything why I didn't. Digging through the 747's maintenance history, investigators discover that seven years earlier, the jet had landed with its nose too high. The tail hit the ground and scraped along the runway. The rear part of the plane had to be repaired, including the pressure bulkhead. Japan Airlines called in Boeing technicians to help repair the cracked bulkhead. After this unscheduled maintenance, the 747 was given a clean bill of health and flew for another seven years. But this bulkhead becomes a prime suspect for the investigators. Well, we had an idea that we wanted to find the rear pressure bulkhead because we had a, a flight attendant who had been interviewed that described an explosion in the back of the airplane and she could see out. So we wanted to focus on the bulkhead. During his investigation, Schleed finds a piece of the panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead seven years before. The mystery of Flight 123 is solved. The 747 went down because of a faulty repair. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. With only one row of rivets straining to hold the repaired panel in place, this was a disaster waiting to happen, especially because this was such a busy jet. This particular airplane was used in Japan on a domestic operation, so it made multiple takeoffs and landings on domestic operations, unlike most 747s that make long-range hauls. So this was considered a high-cycle airplane. Investigators calculate that with the repair job, the bulkhead would survive approximately 10,000 flights or cycles. But on the day of the crash, the 747 had already racked up over 12,000 cycles. On 747 jets, the cabin is pressurized, but not the tail. During flight, the pressurized cabin air presses against the repaired bulkhead. After some 12,000 cycles, this pressure stretched the faulty repair to breaking point. The highly pressurized air blasted into the hollow tail fin and blew it off. Flip up, flip up. Losing part of the tail crippled the plane's hydraulic systems. The Boeing 747 had four independent hydraulic systems to power its systems, so it had quadruple redundancy. 
Unfortunately, these four lines came together on the lower part of the spar, and when it separated, it sheared those four lines. All four hydraulic systems were depleted. Both hands! For some 30 minutes, the crew tried to fly their 747 using only thrust. This is like trying to drive a car using only the accelerator. No steering wheel, no brakes. Despite their heroic efforts, it was a losing battle. All this death and destruction boils down to a missing row of rivets. Why had the growing metal fatigue in the bulkhead remained undetected through seven years of scheduled maintenance and inspections? The primary inspection method for the bulkhead area and the seams was a visual inspection. And at heavy maintenance uh, periods, when they, uh, they would take the insulation out uh, uh, off the walls and everything and off the bulkhead, uh, they would do a, a detailed visual inspection. And during subsequent maintenance checks, the faulty repair was never found. Two decades after JAL Flight 123, airlines are constantly looking for hidden flaws that aren't visible from the outside. Back at the Southwest maintenance hangar, inspectors are using a boroscope, a tiny flexible camera to inspect the engines. Engines are the heart of passenger planes. If they stop working, pilots don't have the option of pulling over to the side of the road. Yeah, there we go. In this uh, area, we're looking for cracks, looking at the uh, blades, the rotor blades, and we're looking for missing material off of them. You know, any hot spots that have worn through the metal, cracks, radial and axial cracks. Any kind of crack or trace of metal fatigue in any of the fan blades could spell disaster. Take off check below the line. Okay, your lights. August the 21st, 1995. Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529, an Embraer Brasilia, is about to take off with 29 people on board. It's bound for Gulfport, Mississippi. It was, at the time, the fastest, sleekest turboprop around. Before the plane even reaches its cruising altitude, something seems to explode outside. The sound of that was tremendous. It was as if someone had taken a baseball bat and hit an aluminum garbage can as hard as they could. It was just a, a gigantic crashing sound. And the airplane immediately lurched to the left. No matter what the flight crew tries to do, the plane pulls violently to the left. Autopilot, engine I'll be hold it. Over there. The captain and co-pilot are pushed to the brink of their experience. Help me. Help me. Help me hold it. Help me hold it. Atlantic Southeast Flight 529 crashes near the small farming community of Carrollton, Georgia. Emergency. Yes, we have a plane crashed in our backyard. A plane crash? All 29 people survive the violent landing. <laughs> but 10 passengers eventually die from their injuries. Called into action, the NTSB creates teams to examine various parts of the plane. Jim Hookey, an aerospace engineer, is in charge of the propeller maintenance group. We came along a lot of pieces of the wing, 
um, came along the, um, the propeller assembly that was missing one part of the blade. The blade broke in a very specific fashion, leaving behind all the telltale signs of a fatigue fracture. A fatigue fracture tends to be a very flat fracture. It also has what we call beach marks radiating out from the origin. So you see these radiating concentric rings coming from the origin of the crack. Hooky had good reason to focus on the broken propeller blade. 17 months before ASA 529, identical propeller blades broke on separate flights over Canada and Brazil. Fortunately, in both cases, the aircraft managed to land safely. The manufacturer of the propeller was Hamilton Standard. Hooky and his team start combing through Hamilton Standard's maintenance records. They're looking for anything out of the ordinary. It's whatever's abnormal. You really don't know what you're looking for until you find it, but you just go through and there's a lot of routine maintenance is done, regular inspections, A, and A, A checks, B checks, C checks, and then there's the non-routine maintenance that occurs if something is broken or a truck hits the airplane or they have a bird strike or something like that. And it's those that you, you look for. The maintenance records reveal that the broken propeller blade had earlier problems. We found out that that propeller blade had actually been removed from service once already uh, for a crack indication. And that became the first clue about there may be a problem with that propeller blade and those inspections. Deep inside the hollow propeller, investigators find what they're looking for. In the hollow interior, or taper bore, weights are inserted to balance the prop. They're kept in place by a cork. This simple cork was the trigger in a deadly chain of events. About 95% of the cork that's produced in the world is used by the medical industry. And for aesthetic purposes and for sterilization, they like to have the light color. So the cork is, is bleached with chlorine. The NTSB discovers that moisture inside the propeller caused the chlorine in the cork to leach out and corrode the propeller's aluminum alloy. They also notice something else on the broken blade. On the inner surface, extending about four centimeters from the fracture, there are a series of sanding marks. Going through the blade's repair records, Hooky notices the initials CSB, Christopher Scott Bender. This technician worked at a Hamilton Standard repair facility. When Christopher Bender watches news of the accident, he learns that the investigators are examining the Hamilton propeller. And as soon as I heard that, my heart just sank. I was like, you know, I, I think I might have even cried a little bit because I was just, you know, just emotionally overwhelmed that, you know, something I had put my hands on, the procedure that somebody trusted me to do failed, uh, and because that somebody had died. After discovering that it was Bender who last worked on the deadly propeller blade, the NTSB now has to find out how the blade had passed inspection at Hamilton Standard. Investigators ask Bender to perform his standard maintenance technique on the propeller. He demonstrated how he would go down into the barrel of the taper bore with a fiber optic bore scope and look for cracks. And therein lied one of the primary problems, the bore scope that he was using had a bright white light that would put a lot of glare back into the inspector's eyes, really did not lend itself to the inspection that was required. And investigators also find a gap in Bender's training. He had never been shown what a crack would look like. He was just told to find a crack, and he would look for a crack. When he was examining the propeller blade, Bender had been unable to detect any evidence of corrosion. He then did what he'd been told to do, polish the inside of the blade. He was given a directive to use a repair to blend out the inside of the taper bore. He blended it out, he did an inspection, and the blending that he had done had roughened the surface so it actually masked 
the indication of the crack in the subsequent inspection, and the blade was returned to service where the crack continued to propagate until it ultimately reached critical length and separated. The draft accident report we present to you today involves Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529. And Embraer According to the NTSB, by polishing the blade, Hamilton Standard had unwittingly removed all traces of the crack. Even a later, more thorough ultrasound examination could not detect it. The company that manufactured Flight 529's propeller is now renamed Hamilton Sunstrand. Its inspection and repair process was made more stringent, in some cases exceeding FAA requirements. Flight 529 was the last time one of its propellers failed in flight. You know, I wish this had never happened. I wish I could go back in time and, and fix it and take care of it, that it didn't happen. Out of the thousands of parts on board an Embraer Brasilia, a simple small cork was the key to a horrific accident. ASA Flight 529 underlines the critical need for proper maintenance. But sometimes maintenance can create the potential for disaster when a new component is installed into an older airplane. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. <laughs> 